is it to be on? This meeting is being recorded. Uh, I was pleased at, at what I found out, but I was also just kind of shocked at the difference between what was being talked about in the popular media about the, the solutions that are available to regular people to combat climate change, you know, that conversation and the reality of what the real issues were and what people really could do, it feels like there was no comparison. People were, you know, the media was talking mostly about recycling and plastics waste and stuff like that. And the more I dug into the problem, the more I realized it's really about energy. That's the, the I mean, yes, plastics waste and recycling are issues. And I don't want to sweep those under the rug, but they're, those are not the solutions that are going to change the world the way the world needs to be changed. And so I felt like there was really this conversation that needed to be happened. They needed to happen with regular people about really big picture, what's causing climate change and how our how us as individuals can really take part in, in changing things for the better. So that's really how Electrify Now got started. And, uh, you know, I would say, even though I was a sustainability professional, I, a lot of what I learned that's, that I think is really important is stuff that I found out on my own and it's kind of what's embedded here. And there are a lot of things that I didn't know that I, that now in retrospect, I'm like, how could I not have known that? But anyway, the, this is starting with the big picture. Um, you know, I don't usually spend a lot of time trying to convince people about climate change or where, you know, carbon emissions being the problem of overheating the earth. I mean, most people kind of get that. But very few people have a really good idea about where carbon emissions really come from. And again, mentioning plastics waste, a lot of people think it's about plastics waste and stuff like that. But so, and if you don't really know where they come from, then it's almost impossible to have a good idea about what you as an individual can, can or we as a society can do about those things. So I like to start a pretty big picture. And, you know, the, the, the fact is, um, while there's lots of problems that need to be addressed around climate change, land use particularly is another big chunk, but we wouldn't be having this conversation about the climate problem if it weren't for the fact that we get of our, all of our energy from burning fossil fuels, because that is by far the number one you know, reason uh, and, and source of carbon emissions and, and reason for climate change. This number will vary from country to country, but in the United States, it's about 80% of our emissions that are from um, burning fossil fuels for electricity, transportation, and heat. Any industrialized country is gonna be right in the same ballpark exactly. You know, uh, a more agrarian economy like you might find in um, some parts of South America or Africa, this number would be lower and the agricultural component would be bigger. But in industrialized nations, it looks pretty much like this where agriculture is about 10%. You have these industrial processes like making steel and cement. You have these fluorinated gases that, that escape from various places and then land water, landfill and wastewater. But 80% is from energy. And at the household level, um, it's a little bit similar. About 60% of the emissions that we are responsible for as, as individuals come from the energy that we consume. And you can think of it as basically your electric bill, the gas, the money you've spent for putting gas in your car and your natural gas bill, if you have natural gas. And the rest of it is either food or things that we purchase. And there's a lot of emphasis in the media, again, on this stuff. I mean, you know, I don't have to tell you how much people talk about hamburgers and stuff like that, which is a whole nother thing that I don't get me started about that. Beef is unnecessarily vilified if you ask me, but regardless, food is a big part of our emissions. And there's some things that we can do as individuals. We can buy local, buy organic products, regeneratively produced um, meat and vegetables. It's a good way to chip away at this and it will lower this number slightly. You can buy fewer things, which is always good. And you can try to buy locally, buy secondhand stuff. Those are, you know, those kinds of mechanisms, you can chip away at these two blue bubbles here. But this big black one, this 60% thing, it's possible for all of us to take this to zero. And we have done it in our home. We know a lot of people who have, we've been helping people 
um, do that. It's not a fun process necessarily, but it's possible. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. And so the bad news is that we have to kind of figure out how to stop burning fossil fuels for these things. We are, we can't, we, we need electricity. We need transportation. We need heat. In fact, more people in the world probably need these things than have access to them now. So we, we, I don't see a future where we use less energy necessarily. I mean, there will be efficiency gains for sure to be made. There's lots of them, but there's also just going to be an increased demand for energy as you know, think of these nations that don't really even have these things now that those people are going to want them. So the need is going to, for these basic energy uh, commodities is going to be there, but we have to figure out how to do it without burning fossil fuels. The good news is that it's possible to do that. Um, and not in every case, but um, the vast majority of cases is possible right now. And there's really good signs that pretty much every need will be solved for sometime in the next 10 years or so. But the, the driving thing behind it all is that wind and solar are now the lowest cost sources of, of energy generation. And some of you may be familiar with this. This is the latest information around the cost of wind and solar compared to um, gas, coal, nuclear, and peaker plants. But the interesting thing is that if for new, this is looking specifically at new electricity generation. So solar and wind beats everything. Um, and this is the, the US focus, but this is true for the most part globally. There'll be some places where it's not true, but on average, th this is the picture. And the interesting thing is that solar and wind are now even competitive with existing, existing plants like coal plants and Fine. gas plants. Yeah, I don't want to add a word with you for the technique. All right. Today. Go ahead. Somebody's yes. have to mute their uh, mute. Their... Well, there is a technician not from Dish, but from DirecTV. Uh, someone needs to maybe mute themselves. That's not, there. Who, that's not who is supposed to come. But <laughs> somebody from. I'm not sure who that is. Um, anyway. Do we have a way of. Uh, Hey, Ron Davis, you need yeah. to put your thing on mute. Well, that's through can, my wife. She, she, she's the one that pays that bill. But this can the host can kids. the host mute that person, please? Can the host mute that person? Who who is it? My, it looks like Ron Davis. <laughs> I did it. <laughs> Yeah, it wouldn't be a Zoom meeting without something like that. So thank you. Yeah, so this is the this is the good news that uh, you know. And in, in, interestingly, you know, solar and wind both decreased by roughly ten percent just in the last year. So this trend isn't stopping; it's maybe slowing down. But projections are that solar and wind still have uh, room to lower in terms of their costs, where that's probably not going to happen with these other technologies. So when you kind of combine that with this other piece of information, which is that electric appliances have become dramatically more efficient over the last decades. And, and we're talking about three to as much as 10 times more efficient. The LED light bulb is a great example of that, where uh, you know an LED light bulb consumes about 10 times less energy than an incandescent bulb. Um, and then this, fact that the grid is just getting cleaner because of the fact that renewables are coming online, coal is retiring. This is the picture here in the United States where, you know, even as electricity use has gone up, the, um, the metric tons from that sector has been decreasing. So you combine all that, those things together and you, you quickly come to this idea about electrifying everything, which is terminology that's starting to get out there more now about this idea of a sustainable future where we're getting all of our power from wind and sun, and we're using that to for everything in terms of electricity, all of our electricity needs, all our transportation needs, and all of our heat. Now, of course, there are things um, like industrial heat, which are still challenging, but for buildings, it's entirely possible to do this today. Transportation, a lot of you know, you know, it's in, entirely possible to do that in some situations, some areas is still tricky like airplanes and shipping, for example, but there's really cool things going on in that area as well.
But when you look at the bulk of what we're using for uh, the bulk of the energy for trans transportation and heat, it's possible to do to transition these to electric electric solutions today. So let's if we just kind of like I invite you to do this yourself. Like think about all the things that you own in your home that um, burn fossil fuels. And so you know, in my case, you know, it was a furnace before I did all these transitions. It was we had a furnace, we had a couple cars, we got a water heater, a stove, we had a fireplace insert. You know, of course, our gas-powered tools, even our barbecue, all these things. Uh, burn fossil fuels of one sort or another. And collectively, they produce about 20 tons of carbon emissions per year, which is pretty much the average for a home in the United States, 20 tons. And if you think about what you actually cost, what actually pay for that, most people don't aggregate this, but when you aggregate it, the average for a household in the United States is $4,000 a year. So that's you know about 900 bucks for electricity, over a thousand dollars each for an automobile um, that's to average, and then about seven hundred bucks for natural gas. And guess where all that money goes? Go, you know, the vast majority of that money goes for fossil fuels that are burned for energy. And when you aggregate that up across all of the households across the United States, this is a staggering number that we regular people. This isn't even including corporations, business, or anything. This is just people like you and I. Collectively, we spend $500 billion a year on energy, primarily for burning fossil fuels. And just as a reference point, last year, or in 2020, the latest data I have, the $85 billion was, you, was invested in clean energy. So it shows you this outrageous imbalance we have where all of the cumulative spending that we have on energy, without even thinking about it, adds up to this giant number. And then the actual investments that are being made purposefully include for renewables is dramatically dwarfed by that just business as usual case. So what if instead of spending all of that money that we spend every year without even thinking about it on the funding the problem, we're basically funding climate solution with our energy bills. What if instead of doing that, we spent our money, that $500 billion that's added up on the solution? And what if doing that actually made our lives better? What if we were happier, we were more comfortable, we were safer? Um, that is why it's exciting to think about this notion of electrification and electrifying at the homeowner level, the, the household level. You know, yes, there's a lot of things that need to be happening policy. There's tons of things that need to be happening by the corporations, but you can see the aggregate of what all of us combined can do is not insignificant. And one of the reasons why I got excited about this is I was frustrated that people tend to throw individuals under the bus as like, yeah, well, you know, when people say, well, what can we do? They go, oh, you got to wait for the politicians to figure it out. We got to wait for the corporations to do their thing. No, it's like if we little people <laughs> kind of take these actions, it, it adds up to something spectacular. So we try to keep it simple. We talk about these four, three steps really in your own life, which is about cleaning up your electric supply, electrifying your home and electrifying your ride. And then of course we need to bring everybody along with us. There are gonna be some people who have trouble in this transition, making these, these transitions. So we, we who can do it, need to help those people and policy needs to help those people to bring them along on this journey with us. So the first step is really about getting clean energy in your home. And it's, it's, it's the easiest step in some ways, but it's, it's also probably the most important because it's so foundational. Um, but the reason why this is important for lots of reasons, but starting with just the emissions that come from energy in the, in the United States right now, it's about 25% of our total emissions come from generation of, of electricity. And on a, for a typical home, it's about three to five tons. That's the um, US number, the Oregon number is almost exactly the same. Um, and again, it depends dramatically on where you get your energy. So if you're a Pacific Power customer, it's gonna be more than this. It's gonna be more like five to eight. If you're a, a PGE customer, it's probably pretty close to this three to five. If you're in one of the, in one of the uh, municipal uh, power um, cooperatives or whatever, they're getting all their energy from hydro, it will be almost zero because that those are um, that's really clean clean energy. 
Um, and of course, you know, here in Oregon, we've got, we're headed towards 100% clean energy by 2040, which is fantastic. Um, but we can all do this right now if we take these relatively simple steps. The first is about green power plants that are available from PGE and Pacific Power both have them and they're good products. They're, they're not the best thing you can do, but they're, they're sort of like so simple and easy to do. I would say if, if any of you haven't done this already, when we get off the call, just go do it. Just click the button. You'll have to spend five bucks more a month or something like that for energy, but you're helping support renewable energy. Rooftop solar, if it works for you, is fantastic, um, but it doesn't work for everybody, but it's probably the, the premium solution because you're, you're actually building more clean energy generation right on your home. And this notion of distributed energy generation is an important foundational concept for how we're gonna to get to 100% clean energy. You know, we can't just rely on these giant um, solar fields places. We, we gotta use, um, get that energy wherever we can. And your rooftop is a good place if, it, if you don't have too many trees and all these sorts of things. But the other solution, which I'm super uh, bullish on is community solar, which a lot of people don't know about. Um, but here in Oregon, we have fantastic uh, program that enables all anybody who lives in either Pacific Power or PGE territory can today you can subscribe to a project. Um, they're just starting to come online now. Um, so you might get waitlisted for a while, but it's worth it to do. And it's a, another situation where your subscription dollars, the money you pay is actually helping to create new clean energy generation for the grid. Um, you will get a discount on your energy bill. You'll save about 5%. And one of the other really exciting things about it is that it has this low income subscriber dimension where there's a proportion of the capacity that's reserved for low income subscribers. And, and the new version of the law says that they get a 40% discount on their electric bills. You and I will get 5% or so, but 40% for low income um, subscribers who sometimes struggle to even pay their bills is a huge, huge advantage. So I'm a big fan of community solar. Common Energy is one of the suppliers that I find um, really easy to work with, but on our website has information about that. But any of these things are going to avoid about three to five tons of emissions per year as we're working on our way towards this 100% clean that the um, policy mandates. And importantly, now everything you plug into your electricity supply is going to be zero carbon, which is uh, really important. So this is maybe gets us to the more meaty part of the of the conversation, which is how to electrify your home. And like I mentioned, you know, we when we think about all those things we own, it can be a long list, but the real culprits are the ones that burn fossil gas. And, you know, we've all of us, you know, our generation has grown up with this idea of the clean blue flame and you know, there's conversations about gas as a bridge fuel and it's cleaner than coal, which is great. It's not that much cleaner than coal, to be honest, particularly when you, when you uh, uh, factor in all the massive amounts of methane leaks throughout the whole supply chain, which are, they, it seems like every year the, the news about that gets worse, not better. There's more leaks and even calling them leaks is kind of a misnomer because in many cases they're purposely discharged. So it's, uh, when you factor all of that in, it's not, methane is not a lot better than coal in terms of its impact, but it, regardless, it's about 25% again of our total emissions. And we use that uh, for the most part. Um, this is the, the, part, the portion of natural gas that's used for heating, not for generating electricity. So this is, there's also part of that in that other 25% we were talking about before. But the thing about natural gas is that, that makes it so, insidious is it's kind of invisible you know like with a car for example um you know you it's a visceral thing you go to the gas station you you, you know plug your car into this hose you smell it you can almost taste it you see it um and when you start your car up you know you're kind of aware of the noise it makes and the heat it generates and the pollution that comes out the back end so it's you're a little bit more aware of cars as uh carbon emitting devices whereas your home most people don't think of it that way, but the truth is you're connected with this big pipe to some of these very same places where we get our, our, our gasoline for our car. 
you don't see it because it's buried underground. It's got this meter going in your house. You don't see the flame for the most part. You don't see the exhaust coming out of the, your roof, but a, a home, an average home creates nearly the same amount of emissions or roughly the same amount of emissions on a yearly basis as an automobile. You, we just don't see it or think of it that way. The big demons are your gas furnace, which can contribute about three tons per year and your water here, which one to three, you know, easily two tons a year if you've got a gas water here. I want to digress a little bit, divert a little bit about, you know, because there's tons of carbon can be really hard to get your brain around. Um, but if we, I like to use plastics again as a sort of uh, proxy for carbon emissions. So if you and I were walking down the street and we came across this pile of garbage in the sidewalk where that had 100 plastic bottles, 100 plastic shopping bags, 100 forks, 100 spoons, 100 knives, 100 of those plastic takeout containers that we hate, uh, 100 plastic yogurt cups, and 1,000 plastic straws mixed into this gruesome pile. We would be horrified, of course, and you, we'd be horrified to know that all that took about 23 pounds of carbon to create that big pile of mess that's up to our knees on the sidewalk. But you'd even be more horrified probably to know that that's less from a carbon impact in one day of heating your home with natural gas. So imagine that pile generating every day that you're heating your home with natural gas, just without, without you even seeing it or thinking about it or realizing it. Or one gallon of gasoline creates more carbon emissions than that huge pile that we just talked about. So I like to think of plastics, you know, like if this visual helps you, if you're taking a bath and you imagine heating your, you know, filling your, your uh, water, your, your bathtub with hot water and the energy it took to do that with natural gas, it's equivalent to the carbon emissions that would, would be produced by filling your tub with plastics waste. So if that helps you to kind of get your brain around what, this, what we mean when we're saying tons of carbon emissions from these devices, um, then so be it. The solution is heat pumps. And since I'm talking to a bunch of engineers here, I probably don't need to explain this way more as much as I do with some people. Act, the truth is I don't try to explain it because they're sort of magical if you ask me. But what, what I do say to people is that while you've never heard the word probably heat pump, um, you, you've had them in your life your whole, since you're a kid and you know your refrigerator is a heat pump basically. And the way they work is they, they move heat from one place to another. They don't create heat. They don't create cool in this, in this standpoint of a, in the case of a refrigerator, they just move heat from one place to another. So your refrigerator, your, your, sorry, your kitchen gets a little bit warmer, but inside this insulated box gets dramatically cooler. In fact, the thing that's shocking about these things and amazing is that even on a hot day, like, I don't know, in our kitchen last summer during the heat dome, it was over 90 degrees in our kitchen. And uh, yet we still had ice in the freezer. So, you know, that's a, you know, difference of well over 50 degrees, um, easily 50 to 60 degrees delta between the, the temperature inside the refrigerator and the place where we were getting that energy from basically, which is your kitchen. So these devices are insanely uh, efficient and they can work both directions. So the freezer and the refrigerator is just cooling, but the same technology can be used to heating. And the same could be true where you're generating temperatures of over 80 degrees from a starting point that's freezing outside. So this is why heat pumps are so exciting it's because they're basically insanely efficient at capturing heat from one place and pushing it somewhere else. So the, the, when it comes to heating your homes, the two versions of that that are uh, available out there, and then sometimes you even see combinations of these things, are what's called ducted or central heat pumps where you're, you've got this external unit that looks like an air conditioner, um, and it's connected with these refrigerant lines into a uh, a air, what's called an air handler it looks like a furnace inside your home is connected to your ducts and it blows hot air through your house. If you don't have ducts, the other option um, is where you've got the, basically the same kind of heat pump unit that's outside um, that's capturing heat from outside and then um, taking warm refrigerant into your indoor unit and then this indoor unit on the wall in this case is blowing warm air into your home. 
And the, the reverse can happen where it's, you know, capturing, um, it's, it's basically cooling like a, uh, an air conditioner does. So these things are fantastic that way because they can heat and cool and they're insanely efficient. A lot of people, when these things were first introduced, they were really only used in the Southern parts of the country because they were better for air conditioning and also gave people a little bit of heat when they needed it in the shoulder season. So their first application in the United States were in Southern areas. And so as a result, partly because of the, the products that were available then, the products that were really even needed in that kind of climate, heat pumps kind of have this reputation as well, not working in cold climates. But that's just not true, particularly with the um, developments in new heat pump technology and just the manufacturers like making the right thing. I mean, these things have been used in Japan for over 50 years and it Japan gets very cold. Um, you know, they had the Winter Olympics there, if some of you remember. So the, the these devices can be used in pretty much all the United States. When you get to the super cold climates, you need more specialty equipment. But in our zone here in zone four, in a specific region and even zone five, these things are insanely effective. And you don't even have to have the world, the, the top uh, most efficient devices in order for them to be effective in this climate. From a cost of operation standpoint, they're also super attractive. This is information from North, uh, Northwest uh, Energy Efficiency Alliance comparing the cost of operation. So this is how much it costs to get 100,000 BTUs of what they call useful heat. So this is heat that you would really notice. You know, so like with radiant baseboard heaters, for example, it can be really warm right next to those things, but in the middle of your room, it's cold. That's why they try to calibrate this into useful heat. But for electric resistance, insanely expensive. Oil furnaces, there's still a few of them out there, a lot of them out there actually important, also really expensive. These are the most relevant ones, a, a, an older gas furnace, like an ADF, 80% um, efficiency is gonna cost you about $1.46 per 100,000 BTUs. A good heat pump will beat that. The best, most efficient modern um, furnace is gonna be a little bit better than that. A heat pump is the, uh, the ductless ones are the most efficient. What I like to tell people is that the differences here over on the right, they're, they're so modest and they're so variable from home to home that I call this a wash. These three are very similar in terms of what it's going to, um, what you're going to experience in terms of operating costs. But in terms of a carbon um, emission standpoint, it's dramatic how much more um, uh, efficient and less polluting the uh, heat pumps are than the, uh, these other options. And, uh, you know, of course, as we talked about before, if you're uh, firing these things with renewable energy, these two bar bars would go to zero. And there's basically no way to get these um, natural gas things to zero. It's not possible. So zero compared to, you know, somewhere between two and, and four tons um, for a, a typical gas furnace. On the water heating side, the savings are more dramatic because if the technology is so efficient that for $10 of natural gas, you get maybe five to seven. You know, this I've, I've made these calculations based on a 10 minute hot shower, which is, you know, probably some people have, for teenagers that might not be adequate, but um, for most of us, that's plenty. Uh, $10 worth of electricity, you can get 10 hot showers with an electric heat pump water heater. And again, the carbon emission comparison is, is dramatic. So in the case of water heaters, you will save money. Um, with furnaces, I don't really, in space heating, I don't necessarily promise people that they'll save money. Although that is going to change because all those calculations I showed you about the cost of operation were based on current gas prices. And if any of you have been paying attention with what's happening with uh, the climate protection program, gas prices, are going to go up by the gas utilities themselves model that it's they're going to likely double, if not triple, sometime in the next 10 years or so. So this comparison between, and, and as we talked about earlier, because electric, electricity prices are going down for generation at least, um, this delta between heating with electricity and heating with gas is going to get more favorable towards heating with electricity, particularly here in Oregon. So 
The good news is there's no compromise. These systems are every bit as comfortable, if not more comfortable, because now you're getting air conditioning as well as heating. You're getting um, really great airflow through your house, which means cleaner air. And in the case of water, you're getting all the hot water you used to have, um, but you're getting it for lower cost. And you're saving huge amounts of, of carbon emissions by taking those two actions. You're, you know, changing your furnace when it's time to do it and changing your water heater when, when, as soon as you can. But there's other th reasons to do this and there's other devices that we own in our homes that are, that are worth mentioning. They're less important from a carbon emission standpoint, but from a quality of life and from a health standpoint, they're really important. Like burning fossil gas for heat cooking is really not a good idea. I mean, when you think about it, you know, the idea that you would have an open flame from gas um, in your house, you know, we, we just kind of like take it for granted, but it's sort of not a great idea. You know, you, you one, you're leaking a lot of this methane into your home anyway, just when you start your gas stove up every, every time. But unless you've got really, really, really good indoor air ventilation, uh, uh, sorry, uh, you know, like a hood, a ventilation hood, a lot of the emissions, the, the carbon monoxide, the nitrous oxide emissions stay inside your home. In fact, a lot of studies are, are showing that, you know, peak indoor air pollution from your gas stove can reach levels that would be illegal if it was outside. There's no regulations for that indoors. There's huge correlations between the using, use of um, fossil gas stoves and asthma, particularly in children. So it's a real health concern and induction, which is better technology for pretty much every reason, the easier to clean, the heat faster, the cool down faster, you have more control, they're safer because you don't have these residual heat problems that you do with, um, with uh, the grates and things like that from gas stoves. And none of these nitrous oxide or, or carbon monoxide emissions. So much superior technology. And the, tr the same is true whether you're cooking on your stovetop or whether you've got a gas fireplace sensors, the electric ones are fantastic. We have them in our house. No one would even know the difference if I didn't tell them. Gas, you can use, we have a gas barbecue there. We changed to electric, amazing, and of course, power tools. So every, in every case, the electric option is better. Um, and once you make the change, you'll be happier. I really believe that. I know everyone that that I know who's done this is, has no regrets and wouldn't go back. So that's your home, which um, is, is kind of maybe one of the, the hardest parts. Um, I wanted to touch base on transportation though, because you know while this is maybe picking up a lot of steam, there's still a lot that we as individuals need to do to help um, push this along. Because, uh, Carbon emissions from transportation are growing, and here in here in Oregon, they're more like 40 or 45 percent. But um, nationally, it's 30. It's mostly it's mostly from cars. A lot of people have this idea about airplane travel and stuff being the problem, and yes, that's a problem. But airplane travel is about six percent of our transportation emissions, compared to 60 percent of our transportation emissions coming from automobiles. So, yes. Airplanes are a problem, but let's focus on the big problem and the one that we have a solution for, which is our automobiles, which produce about four to eight tons per year and 75 to 100 over its lifetime. So back to this plastics thing, you know, if it helps you, imagine every time you fill up your gas car that you're literally cramming the inside, every nook and cranny with plastics waste, as much as you can shove in there. That's kind of the equivalent um, every time you fill up your, your car. And a lot of people say, well, yeah, but, you know, aren't gas, but electric cars, you know, but they get dirty electricity from the grid. Are they really cleaner? I love this map from the Union of Concerned Scientists. They update this and these numbers go up, up and up every, every time they do. When they first did it, I think in the Northwest, this number over here was in the 80s. Now it's over 100. This is the equivalent miles per gallon you would have to have from a gas burning car to be as uh, environmentally uh, equivalent from a carbon emission standpoint with an EV. And some EVs are better than this, by the way, like Tesla's, for example, these numbers are about 10 or 20% uh, higher because they're so much more energy efficient. But for a, this is for average uh, electric vehicle use based on sales, weighted sales in the United States. Here in the Northwest, you'd have to be getting over 100 miles per gallon. 
even in the dirtiest parts of the country where the grid is the dirtiest, you'd have to be getting over 40 miles per gallon with a uh, gas powered car to, to produce fewer emissions than a, an EV. And as you all know, there's very few vehicles that get over 40 miles per gallon. Yeah. So this is really good news. The other reason that it's, it's exciting thinking about electric vehicles is they're just so much more energy efficient. I love this comparison. We actually have one of these when we doing that diesel gate thing, we, we turned our VW diesel golf in for an electric vehicle version of the same car. So these are two versions of the exact same car. And for $10 worth of gasoline, you can go about a little less than hundred miles in a VW golf, $10 of electricity, you can go over 300 miles in the E version of that same exact car. And this is why the, the trucking industry is really excited about um, electric, um, trucking and delivery vans and all those sorts of things, which you'll see happening soon. A lot of people think that EVs are expensive and at sticker price, I love this comparison. This is two versions of the same um, car, the Kona and the Kona EV. And when you first look at it, you go, oh my gosh, yeah, the EV is a lot more expensive. But when you consider the federal and state incentives, um, that takes a huge whack out of it. But when you look at the five-year cost of operations, um, what if operating it, maintaining it, because maintenance on these things is virtually zero, uh, it's actually cheaper over five years to own the EV than it is to own the, um, the gas burning car. And this is true with every comparison that I've done of an EV compared to a comparable model. I use this one because there's two that are really similar um, from the same supplier. But they're cheaper than you think. Used ones are fantastic. A lot of people ask me about the batteries. Well, what about the batteries? This is another reason why people sort of, this is another myth that's out there about EVs. But yes, if you look at the comparison, there is a difference, like a gas car, and this is again from the Union of Concerned Scientists, nine tons to build a, a, a full-size car, gas burning car, <clears throat> but over its lifetime, it's gonna produce about 103 tons altogether, including the gasoline that you used, which is the, the vast majority of the emissions come from gasoline, not from making it. So the gasoline is burned for operating it, which is true with almost every, well, no, it's true with every fossil fuel burning device. Making it was a small fraction of the total emissions that it will generate over its lifetime, which is why you wanna get rid of them as soon as you can. Don't hold on to it thinking you're doing the earth any favors. When you compare this to an EV, yes, the manufacturing um, emissions are higher because of the battery, more like 15 tons for a full-size car rather than nine. But the emissions, and again, this is national average, are dramatically fewer. So on the whole, they're about half. But if you're doing what most people can do, and what we advocate is that you are charging your, device, your car at home, which is what most people do. Um, and that's one of the reasons why the electric cars are so nice is because you don't need to go to these public charging stations or even or, or gas stations. Essentially, the real comparison is between, you know, 15 tons versus 100 tons. So, and this 15 tons will be going down because manufacturing of automobiles in general, and particularly the, like, think about Tesla, they're really working on using renewable energy to make their products in the first place. So, I expect this comparison to get better over uh, time, not worse. But that's really the, the picture of it, even including the batteries. All right, so I wanna spend a little bit of time here on this, this idea of electrifying everyone, this notion that you know it's one thing for people like us with means to think about, you know, yeah, it's time to replace my furnace or my hot water heater is about to break. I should replace it now. That's one thing. But if you're struggling to even pay your electric bills, it's hard to contemplate this notion of buying a new gas furnace or buying a new water heater or buying a new car. All those things are more difficult. So we, we have to find ways to, you know, help those people and bring them along. And there's, you know, lots of reasons. Why I, this has been a big eye opener for me as the more I've dug into this. I used to really come at this like, Hey, a pound of carbon is a pound of carbon wherever we can get it. And it's, that's true to some degree, but there is a whole swath of our community that has been 
um, uh, much more affected by the ill effects of uh, fossil fuels over for generations in terms of where they live and the exposure they have to the, the uh, pollution that comes from these things, as well as the, the fact that they pay a much higher proportion of their total income for these basic energy things that a lot of us almost take for granted. You know, mo most of us don't worry about paying our electric bill, but there are some people who have to make the decision between doing that and feeding their families. So it's, it's a real thing. So we have to be find ways to help bring those people with us. Policies are, is probably the, the biggest lever to pull, but there's, you know, philanthropy can help. And, you know, one, one of the things we've tried to do with our organization is we've teamed up with Community Energy Project to create this, what we call the Electrify Everyone Fund. We um, advocate for, and try to help to get donations to this fund from wherever we can get them. And essentially what we do is we uh, replace gas water heaters, old gas water heaters in low income um, homes here in the Portland area with free heat pump water heaters, which has two big benefits. It saves these families money on their energy bills, hundreds of dollars a, a, a year and avoids about 25 tons over the lifetime of that product. Um, and that data is from real installation data because we, we've installed about 50 of these now over 50, and so we have really good data about the households we've gone in and done on how much they used it, um, what their energy bills really were. And so these numbers of 25 tons and 1,750 bucks over the life of the product is, is based on real um, data. So we're a big, you know, this is one way to help, you know, maybe throw some um, charity and benevolent uh, donations towards this problem, but we, we definitely need policy to help um, push these people to the front of the line for electrifications, because they're the people who are gonna benefit in some cases more than the rest of us. All right, so just, you know, maybe if you only remember a few things from this, you know, I would ask you to remember that, you know, the four largest sources of carbon emissions in your life are the electricity that you get, um, the car that you drive, and your furnace and your water heater. Those are the good places to focus, but of course, anything that burns fossil fuels should be uh, swapped out for an electric alternative. Our website, um, please check it out. We have lots of good practical advice. It's organized in the same way around to clean up your electric supply, electrify your home, et cetera. Um, we have a, a take action page, which um, we've done a lot of work on where if you click, we're trying to make it really easy for people. If you wanna figure out how to sign up for a clean energy plan, click here, it'll show you how to do it. If you wanna sign up for, clean, for, for community solar, They'll give you background information on why that's a good thing, what it really is, and give you links for where to go to do it. If you're thinking about solar, we have installers that we've um, worked with that will pass on a discount um, for uh, because we promote them. We've been we don't get anything out of that. We've just been trying to make it as easy as possible for to do these things. So I've had personal experiences when I was trying to get a heat pump water heater where the first few contractors I call try to talk me out of it. So we part of the reason for me doing this is to have installers that I know, one, do good work, two, are excited about this technology and have a lot of experience with it, and three, aren't gonna talk you out of it because that's the worst possible situation. And then, you know, most of them, all of them actually will, will um, pass on a, a small discount be, because we, we kind of promote them this way. So the, the website hopefully is another tool that you can use to help you if you're thinking about doing these things. But at the end of the day, you know, I think it's good to remind ourselves, we, we all want these basic things, clean air, clean water, safe jobs, you know, a climate that's not freaking out on us. We all want this. But in burning fossil fuels is the problem. I think if that, if we really focus our, there's other problems, land use problems, for, for example, but fossil fuels is the big one. And, and that's the one that we can all really participate in transforming our systems, you know, and if we think about changing systems, not changing behavior, changing behavior is not going to solve the problem. We can't expect everybody to just live small lives and go, you know, turn their lights off. We have to change our energy systems and the way we spend our energy dollars can really be a big part of doing that. So that's, that's our message. Um, well, Brian, thank you for that. Uh, that's been very informative, certainly to me. And we did have a few uh, chat questions. Uh, I know Conrad 
uh, had several chat questions. Uh, Conrad, could you uh, ask uh, Brian a question now? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. So that, that levelized cost of wind and solar, the levelized cost of energy is no longer relevant for planning because that assumption assumes that all the wind and solar that you generate from those assets is consumed in the grid. And that does actually occur today because it finds a place somewhere. But as we approach 100% renewable, what happens is you've got to have energy for windless nights, for example. Well, how are you gonna do that? You're gonna have to store it in batteries or pump storage or shift energy use to some extent, but you're still gonna need a lot of batteries. And so that levelized cost of energy is not relevant until you put the cost of firming for an entire system. And so versus power plants, of course, can be run to meet load as necessary. And so they, uh, it's not an apples to apples comparison when you do a slide like that. That's a good point. And there's truth to what you say, absolutely. But I would point out, we're nowhere near the point where this issue that you're bringing up is a problem. You know, when we get to 70% renewable energy, then I will be worried about that problem. But at the moment, we're not even close. So the dispatchability issue is a red herring in the conversation at the moment, moment because we've got tons of dispatchable energy. We've got, well, more, than we true. We've got more than we need. The, the, industry. What, the, problem, the problem is using less of fossil fuels. And right now, I'd be, you know, ex excited if we could get from 22%, you know, non-fossil fuels that we have right now, which a lot of that's hydro, the actual amount of renewable energy in the system is so small that this issue you're talking about is not a problem at the moment. It at is some point problem. it will be. At Let some me stop point you. It will be. And you're not, you're is, diminishing the problem on two accounts. One is we need decades to plan for 100% renewable. Yes. And I bring up this point because nobody, I don't hear people talking about this incredible problem. Uh, Pacific Corps just announced yesterday there was a thing in uh, o, or, um, OPB about this huge storage, pump storage that they're building to deal with precisely. The other way you're undercounting it is California throws away almost as much energy per year, <laughs> literally by turning things off that Oregon uses per year. Now they're a much bigger state. So it's already a problem. So don't dismiss it. I'm all for wind and solar and I wouldn't change it for a second. I want people to recognize that you can't just throw up levelized cost of energy and say, oh, life is beautiful. I agree it's de minimis today, but it's not in a planning sense. Yeah, no, I hear you. I, I, I agree with you. I would also just say, you know, if you looked at the cost of battery storage, it, it's 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 following those same curves and the amount of the amount of research dollars that's going into storage is astronomical. So I just, the reason why I don't spend time on that is because all those things that you bring up are important issues and they're real and people are really grappling with them. But the, the everyday person doesn't need to worry about that because that stuff is happening. And what the, the, the point that I try to make is the economics of renewable energy are inexorably moving us in that direction. In fact, there's a lot of people who, who are saying that the world will be 100% renewable energy by 2045 for economic reasons alone, because partly because of what we just talked about with wind and solar generation, but these same trajectories is happening for battery storage, for electrolyzer costs, and those, those wind storage electrolyzer costs and battery storage costs are the four things that are going to have to happen in order for us to get clean energy generation, clean energy storage, and dispatchable energy through renewable hydrogen, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I agree with your point, but the reason why I don't spend a lot of time on it is because the, the, the piece of information that's important for people to know is the renewable technology is crashing below the cost of fossil fuels generation technology at a it's rapid good. rate. Your and audience today though, sustainable engineers, if they're not already aware, need to be aware. And fair, fair. any professionals need to be 
lobbying for much more planning on the long term. And, and a general audience, I'm with you 100%. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, th thank you, Conrad. I, I just uh, noticed that uh, Gary Rayer, is that, is that pronouncing that last name right? Yeah. You had a question. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, cool. Uh, well, my only question was on the car slide, uh, the 94 tons for like a standard car, how many years that represented? And somebody threw up a comment, 17 years. Uh, what, what was that number of years? Uh, 12, I believe, if I remember correctly, the, uh, is the, the, it's either 12 or 15. Let me just think for a second, 12. That's, it, it's 12 that's to 15. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. Something in I that mean, range. Yeah. yeah, so if you keep a car longer, if you get an efficient gas car and you keep it longer than that nine tons of initial uh, uh, manufacturing um, emissions is spread out longer and then your car is more efficient, I'm totally into electric. I'm What I'm waiting for, so I have a 17-year-old Prius. What I'm waiting for is just the, and so I definitely need a new car soon is is the infrastructure to catch up and to just address Conrad's issue okay I'm a I'm a I'm a graduate engineer I've been engineering 42 years I think it can all it'll all it can all be we can move the whole thing towards sustainability by trying to use a maximum amount of of the energy at, during the generation of wind and and solar like during the day if you have super insulated houses you know heat them up <laughs> and you know it's just to me i don't i don't see it as any kind of insurmountable problem at all i, be, I mean it's okay it might take 20 years but so be it i don't just don't see it as a problem and the problem with with a lot of engineers is they go well you don't have the, the solution now well you know i i totally think it's solvable well, you, you brought up a lot of really good stuff there. <laughs> yeah, well, you can see where I'm at, you know. <laughs> no, 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 it's really good. Thank you. Uh, a couple of things I would respond to there. Um, yes, I do think we, all of us, can fall into this trap of worrying about the 100% solution. And, and it's a strategy that the fossil fuels you, um, people use all the time scaring us about how hard it's going to be to get to 100%. When right now we should be talking about how we get to 10% or 5% even. Automobiles in the United States were at like 2%. So, you know, this problem of the 100% problem to me is a used as a reason or can be used as a reason for inaction. And that's why I bristle when people bring that up, even though they're legitimate questions. I don't disagree, but they're not a reason not to act today. So that's one thing. The, the other thing is that, um, you know, you, you talked about electric cars and infrastructure. I think one of the things that people would be shocked to know is to, and I should add this to my slide deck, is Google how many electric car chargers Tesla has out there and look at the map. You'd be staggered. And the data is that there's 46,000 public charging stations in the United States, 46,000. There's 150,000 gas stations. Okay, so yes, we need more public charging stations, in particular fast charging stations. But that the truth about electric vehicles that most people don't get is that, you know, if anyone has one here, you'll know what I'm talking about. You very rarely, if ever, go to a public charging station. You charge them at home, which is one of the things that's so nice about this. So we don't need 150,000 public fast charging stations for automobiles. We absolutely do not need that because at least half or more of the charging will happen at home for public, for automobiles. Now there's some people who can't do that, for example, living in an apartment building, you know, et cetera. But the vast majority of people who have the ability to charge at home. So the infrastructure that we need, most of the infrastructure you already have, it's your house, but, there are situations for long distance driving and stuff like that where it can be problematic. One of the things that I try to point out to people that, you know, the average household in the United States has two cars. So there's absolutely zero reason why one of those cannot be an electric car today. And if, if you have long distance driving needs, blah, 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 
that's what your second car could be for. You know? So I really feel like there's not nearly as many impediments as a lot of people think around um, moving to electric vehicles today. The other thing that you said, which I, which I also just want to react to because it's such a good comment, which, which is about this, this idea of, I think in there was this notion, which is another thing that gets that people um, hold on to is this notion of holding on to devices as long as possible, extending their useful life. If, if you're talking about furniture or a pair of jeans or something like that, that's true because the only emissions associated with that thing was what, what it cost with the emissions associated with producing it. With an automobile and these other devices that burn fossil fuels, it's like the faster you shut them down, the less damaging they are. So that idea about you know, spreading the, the cost of the emissions of their initial use over a longer life doesn't make sense in this context because what we're trying to do is minimize emissions. So the best solution if you're, is, to, is to take your electric, your current gas car and drive it to the recycling dump and, and, and get a, a, an EV today. That's the best solution. Most people won't do that because you want to get some residual value out of your car. I get it. Let somebody else drive it. And, and have you, I have you to have a slide in this. I didn't put it in this deck for, for brevity, but the best thing for people like us who are trying to do the right thing is to buy EVs now and send those signals to the market, get more EVs made, clean up the pipe at the front end. You know, imagine this big pipe of, of automobiles going from new to junk pile. We got to get the front end cleaned up. So the more people like us who care about this load the front end of the pipe with EVs, the cleaner the pipe will get eventually. Um, and the longer we wait to do that, if you wait till your, your car's going out the back end, you, you're just delaying um, changing. So that's, that's how I try to think about that notion of hanging on to things. It's, it's uh, about one o'clock and uh, we've scheduled from uh, noon to one. Uh, and I, I know there's more questions in the chat. If someone has a really uh question they really like to ask now uh, go ahead i'm i'm sorry if i uh, i i didn't wasn't able to bring up everybody's uh chat here i really quick brian um i'm mark gamba i'm the mayor of milwaukee i would love to have a conversation with you about the policies that you referenced earlier we don't have to do that online here but um if we can if i can get your email or something i'd love to have that conversation yeah, that would be great. Uh, nice to meet you, Mark. You, you and I have actually traded a few email conversations, uh, but I'll, I'll ping you. I um, and I would love to follow up with you on that. Okay, cool. Thank you. Great presentation. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Brian. If if anybody else has a, a a question they'd really like to have answered, it would be okay if they send me an email and I'll forward it to you, and you you could uh, respond. Absolutely. I love doing that. And, you know, the other thing I would offer if anybody's interested and in, I do this regularly for people. I mean, if, if you if you're thinking about your own household situation and you're thinking about your water heater or your furnace or something, I'm happy to answer questions. I've, I've helped literally hundreds of people through this transition from one th one device to another. So it can be daunting if any of you I mean, not, you guys are really competent people. I'm sure you probably can do it on your own. But if you have questions you know, in and I'm happy to answer that, answer anything that I can that way too. So um, feel free to ping me, I guess is the bottom line. I'm, I'm, I love the dialogue. All right, and one final thing, if anyone wants a professional development hour for their engineering license uh, for, for attending this, please send an email to Mike Unger at Comcast and I'll, I'll forward you the, the uh, form. I put my email in the chat there in case anybody wants it. Okay, Brian Stewart at Electrify Now. Yeah. Not that. All right. Super. Well, I hope that covered at least some of the, I mean, this, you know, this is one of these things that we could talk about for a long time, but I, um, I really appreciate the opportunity to chat with you all and hope that was helpful. And yeah, let me know if anybody has further questions. Thank you, Brian. Uh, I, I just, uh, I'm Bob James. I just wanted to uh, kind of second what uh, Conrad Eustace was saying, and that is when, and this isn't unique to you, but when we 